Welcome, my name is Steve Gordon and in this video I want to spend a few minutes sharing with you how an ASP.NET Core 2.0 application starts up. I've got a basic web application here created using the API template and if I open up Program CS we'll take a look at what's in there. So you can see this is a program class and it's got a static void main method and this may seem familiar if you've used console applications in the past because ASP.NET Core applications are self-hosted and so really are just console applications. So the Core CLR is going to look for this signature of this static void main method and use that as the entry point into our application. Once in that main method, it's going to call down to the build web host method below. And the build web host method is going to return an iWebHost. And it does this using a static method on uh, the static web host class called create default builder. And what create default builder is going to do is create us an iWebHost builder with some default settings applied into that builder. And then once we have that back, we can add some more configuration and override if we wish to. So I wanted to just explore what that create default builder method is doing. And to do that, I'm just going to load up the GitHub page with the code for that particular um, method. And this is one of the beauties of ASP.NET Core that we can just go in and look at the source code. I mean, we could pull this down and explore it in more detail if we really wanted to. But for now, let's just have a quick look at some of the main things that are going on inside this method. So you can see it starts there by newing up a web host builder. And once we've got one of those, we can start calling methods on there. So the first of those is the use Kestrel method, and that's going to tell the application or the builder that we want to use Kestrel as our web server. And Kestrel was introduced with ASP.NET Core 1.0 as a, a lightweight, uh, very fast uh, web server. Next, we define that we want to use the content route. So where is that content route of our application where views and actions, for example, can be located by the MVC framework? Next, we do some configuration of configuration. So this is the configuration framework that's available to us in ASP.NET Core to uh, provide settings for our application. Now, you may remember if you've used 1.0 uh, ASP.NET Core projects in the past, that we did a lot of this setup actually in the startup class originally. And this has been moved kind of early in the application lifecycle so that the configuration can be set up and used earlier by the rest of the application. And inside there, we can see that what we're doing is, firstly, we're finding out what environment we're running under. So that may be production or staging or development. And then we start adding in configuration from various sources. And the first of those is a JSON file, which is called uh, added in using the add JSON file um, method there. And it's looking for app settings.json, which is usually there by default if you've used any of the templates. And if it finds that file, it's going to load in any settings that it finds within there. Then we've got a second add JSON file method, and this time it's looking for app settings dot, and then the environment name dot JSON. Um, and this becomes really useful because if you want to provide different configuration per environment, which is very common where you may have different connection strings or keys that you need to issue in those environments, um, this allows us to do that just by providing those files into the solution uh, with the appropriate naming. And then once it finds a match, it will load in any configuration values, which will override any values that were previously set in appsettings.json. Next, if we're in the development environment, which we would be if we're working with Visual Studio locally, um, it's going to look and see if there's any user secrets it can load in. And user secrets is a kind of f feature of ASP.NET Core and Visual Studio that allows us to set per machine uh, kind of development settings, which are stored in a secure file. Um, and this is useful because we don't want to check those secrets into the source code of our project generally. And normally they're not really going to be relevant outside of our machine. We might be running a local instance of a database server, for, for example. So if it finds any of those, those will be loaded in. Then it will look for environment variables. So it's going to read all the environment variables on the system where it's running. And if any of those match the names of the settings it already knows about, then it will load in those values and override um, what's previously been set. And that's very useful if you're running, for example, in Docker, which we do uh, quite often. Uh, you can start your Docker containers by passing that container environment variables. So this is a very nice way to get those settings into 
an application and then they're not stored in uh, source control at all. Um, and then finally, it's going to look and see if any command line um, arguments were passed in when the application started up. It will look to see if any of those match settings and override with those. Uh, let's scroll down a little here. So next up, it's going to configure the logging. Uh, again, this used to be in the startup class. We used to do this in the configure method where we would set um, some of the configuration for logging. But now it's again moved earlier in this lifecycle so that we can log exceptions much earlier, maybe how um, how the application is starting up or any problems it faces. Um, and so what that's going to do is, is for this point, it's going to add in console and debug logging. So any log messages that it collects are going to be output to console and debug there. And it's going to determine which kind of logging levels it's looking for from the configuration. So you can see it's going to try and get the, the logging configuration section there um, and load in the values for what each different maybe namespace is meant to uh, expose. Maybe you only want to log errors um, for the Microsoft stuff, but you may want to log um, more detailed informational messages from your own namespaces. Next up, it's going to use uh, IS, IIS integration, and this is going to enable this to operate behind IIS, which is um, not necessary but it's generally a good practice to put this behind a much more uh, robust web server. Um, it will still use Kestrel within your application hosting, but this allows you to run behind IIS. If you're not running behind the IIS, uh, that's fine. This will no op, so it's not going to do anything um, to your application if it's not already connected behind IIS. And then finally, we see that the default service provider is added in. So this means that the Microsoft DI framework will be loaded and, and set up ready to start registering services there. So finally, that's returned, which uh, will come back out. Um, if we jump back to the code, you can see it comes back out. And then we've, we've still got that iWeb host builder, so we can still call methods on there in this uh, program class here if we want to do any overrides or additional setup. For now, it's just going to call use startup, which tells it where the startup file lives. And um, we'll look at that in more detail, but startup is going to allow us to configure our services and configure our middleware pipeline. And then finally, it calls build. So this will return the, the iWeb host, or in this case, the, the concrete web host that we need. That gets bounced back up to the main method. And in there, you can see once it's got that iWeb host, it's calling run. And that's going to just block. Um, block the application from closing down and mean that it's in a state where it can receive HTTP requests that it will then handle through the rest of the pipeline. So that's it. We've looked at how um, the application gets started up and uh, we'll explore that in more detail in a future video. For now, thank you very much for watching and I hope you'll join me in another video again soon.